BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Welcome to the download of Moneybox Live, the programme about your money. We're back to homeschooling this week, back to teaching fronted adverbials and the life cycle of bean plants. But there's something else that kids need to be taught, and that's how to manage money. On today's programme, we're going to find out what makes financial education work, how parents can build on what's taught in schools, and exactly what it is that children want and need to know. But before we meet today's panel, how much do children know? I spoke to three kids. Okay, I spoke to my own three kids, aged nine, seven and four, to find out. OK, what's money for? Um, you can spend it on stuff like food, water and Lego sets. What's a current account? I don't know. What does interest mean? I don't know. What's a credit card? A thing that you use for getting your money out of banks. Is it better to spend money or save it? I often save it, but sometimes spend it straight away. Where does your pocket money come from? Your mum and dad. And where do we get it from? The bank. And how do we get it into the bank? Pop the lid off. Right, clearly my three could do with some financial lessons, but it's really hard to know how to go about it. So I'm personally going to be making notes over the next half an hour. I want to start with those early years. And joining us on the line is Emma, who's the joint winner of the Primary School Personal Finance Teacher of the Year Award. Emma, congratulations. Thank you. So what ages were you teaching and and how did you get your classroom buzzing? Okay, so I teach um, three to five-year-olds, so our nursery and reception children at our school. Um, And we have been doing a topic on babies, um, and we actually had a little boy who was going to have baby twins, so it was really relevant for our class. Um, And towards the end of our topic, we talked about all about the the things that babies would need, like um, bottles and a baby bath, um, clothes and those kind of things, and nappies. Um, and towards the end of the topic, uh, I gave the class a challenge. So um, I gave them £10 in £1 coins because we've been talking about numbers to 10 as well. And um, we, um, I set up a shop. So in the shop, there were things, for, um, things that babies would need, so nappies and clothes and things like that. But also in the shop, there were some things um, that the children would be really tempted with. So there were some chocolates and a package <laughs> of sweets. Um, so I'd carefully um, amounted the items for the baby that would add up to 10 um, and I priced the items of the chocolate and the sweets at sort of £3 and £4 so if the children decided that's what they needed to buy they weren't going to be able to buy everything for the baby um, so it, it promoted lots and lots of discussions um, between the children in our class and, um, and one, one little boy decided that he wanted to buy the sweets and then we quite quickly realised that we ran out of money because we, we couldn't buy the nappies because we'd run out of money. Um, so we had lots of discussion about, well, what's really important? You know, what, what things do we have as a treat and what things do we really need? Um, and the children were able to kind of talk about that as three, four and five year olds. And they realised that actually they needed to take the sweets back to the shop and then they could afford to buy all the things for um, the ba- that the baby needed. And I wasn't, I wasn't that mean. So we did, <laughs> we did have our sweets and chocolate <laughs> at the end. <laughs> but that really good budgeting lesson there. Now, you, you talked about ages three, four and five. Was there any age that they just seemed too young to really grasp that idea of managing money? Uh, not really. Um, because our nursery and reception children work really closely together, um, our nursery children really pick up on what the reception children are doing. Um, and uh, no, they all kind of grasp that concept. Um, we also have at our school, we have our own currency, so the children um, can earn what we call the ARCs, because we're our home school. And um, they can earn arcs for doing jobs around school, so they might pick up some litter or they might tidy something up or help a teacher out, hold the door open, or just for being kind. Um, and then the children can earn those arcs and they, add the, um, they keep them. And then on Friday we have an arc shop, so um, the children can come along to the arc shop and um, they can buy something that might be one arc, so maybe a little rubber or something, or they can save up their arcs to buy something for maybe 15 or 20 arcs, which is something really amazing, like a little cuddly toy or a car or something like that. 
Um, and our three and four and five year olds have really sort of started to understand that actually, if I save up my ARC, then I can buy something that's much better. And so we introduce that uh, sort of with the three and four year olds. And as they move up to school, it continues with them and they get to kind of carry on learning that journey. Great to hear. Some really good ideas there. Emma, thank you very much. Listening to that is our panel. We've got Rebecca Kelly, Head of Education for School Age at MyBank, which provides financial education for kids and young adults. Dr Elizabeth Kilby, who's a consultant clinical psychologist specialising in talking to families about money. And Stephanie Fitzgerald, Head of Young People Programmes at the Money Charity Panel. Good afternoon. Elizabeth, let's talk to you first. So Emma there was talking about teaching even three-year-olds. Is there a good age? Is there an ideal age to start talking to kids about money? Well, my view is that you can't start too soon because the reality is that money is a part of everyday life and we want children to understand that. And when I talk to families about it, they have lots of reservations about exposing this idea to young children because there's this sense that we're somehow burdening them. We're somehow kind of spoiling this ideal of this idea of childhood that should be so carefree that parents don't want to bring this very difficult concept of money in. But my view is the sooner you start introducing this and teaching them and giving them some skills, actually what you're doing is you're freeing them up to be the kind of adult that can manage their money without any worries. And for me, that's definitely a lesson worth learning. Absolutely. Rebecca, Emma's teaching her class those really practical lessons and they all convey that idea of delayed gratification, which is really essential, not necessarily easy to teach. So what other ways can parents give children that lesson? I think the thing that we start to talk about with delayed gratification is long and short term savings goals and looking towards the future. I think we find Traditionally, children will want to play shop and they will want to, you know, understand money. I think they naturally start to, to do that, especially as they socialise more as they get to school. Uh, something that we do is bring in some, some fun loving characters, especially to help with the real little ones. So work we do with our five to seven year olds. We have a, a character called Saversaurus to help encourage them to, to make positive um, habits and spending choices. And also there's a lot of things in the media at the moment about things like the marshmallow test and the fruit snack challenge. So it doesn't always have to be directly related to money, but it is the idea of getting children to understand that they can wait to have a better reward later and actually waiting for something, resisting that temptation can be a really positive thing for them. Um, something further that we do at my bank is reinforce about choices. So we have activities with really tactile pretend money for young people to get used to making those choices with their money. And we also give them would you rather challenges where they have to make a choice. Do I want this now or actually do I want something better a little bit later on? And it's sometimes about getting them to think about other people and the impact that that might have. Uh, and the other thing we do is we talk about the feelings that you get when you spend money and when you save money and actually when you really get something that you've wanted for a long time. Stephanie, you work with more high school, senior age kids. We're in this crisis at the moment. Lots of parents will be having to cut back. What is the best way to explain that money is tight without worrying children? Well, firstly, um, I'd say it's really important to do so, to have that conversation with young people. Um, it's a great opportunity to share, you know, the kinds of financial decisions that adults have to make. Um, and that's the kind of thing we talk about in our money workshops. So this is a great teachable moment um, to, to share these things with young people. And they'll really appreciate, you know, the fact that you've had, um, you, you respect them enough to talk about these issues and, and, and things that are going on in the family. Um, so I would say you know tell them the facts um, be as straight with them as you feel comfortable to be about the situation um, explain you know why and the wider context um, of the, the pandemic if that's the reason for things being tighter for your family um, acknowledge that it's worrying you know and that and that it, you may feel anxious as a result and that that is normal um, but you know reassure them as well in, in the best way that you can um, and I would would recommend as well trying to involve them in in solutions where you can and trying to make it fun so maybe like challenge them to find some cheaper versions of what you usually buy in the supermarket something like that that will help them to feel like they have some control and that and that they're helping the family to to manage that tighter budget so do you think that can help them manage their their worries at the moment and teach them a lesson that will be helpful throughout their lives yeah, exactly. And and strengthen your relationship as well. Um, if they feel that you know, you res respect them enough to share your worries with them. 
Thank you. And thanks very much to Emma. Let's speak to our next caller, Harry James. Harry, hello. Hi. Hello. You're a student at the moment, I know, but you, when you were 15, you took part in workshops that were run by the charity UK Youth Money. And you now actually give those lessons yourself. So tell us about that scheme. Yeah, so I've been working like as a volunteer alongside UK Youth on their Money for Life programme. And I basically received some training from a youth worker to be able to go out to deliver sessions to other young people, basically to teach them about um, the importance of money and um, avoiding scams and understanding things like banking and all the terms relating to that as well. Um, so some of the things we do at the workshops would be something like um, we do different workshops on different jobs and where the young people would stand up and interact together to decide where they think like different jobs are worth, like how much money a nurse might make in comparison to how much money a tube driver makes. And it's them sort of discussions um, really get people talking and that's what we really want to do with the aim of this um, programme, is to get young people talking about money. And is there a real appetite among the people you're giving these workshops to? Do they want to know this stuff? Yeah, um, so I feel like at the end of the day, it's something we can all relate to because um, young people as well, they're still dealing with money all throughout their lives. And especially as you get to the age of around 16 as well, I often find that's when young people often start getting bank accounts and stuff like that. And it can be quite a nerve-wracking time for young people not knowing all these terms and stuff. Like, I know myself, I was quite scared about understanding how a bank works and all the big terms that they give you. And at the end of the day, money is something that's really important. Mm. And I knew that at a young age as well. So... I wanted to make sure I was doing it right, really. Are you able to keep uh, giving your workshops despite the COVID-19 crisis? Yeah, so currently we're not able to continue running that, but UK Youth have just recently um, won funding from Nestle's Rapid Recovery Challenge as well. And that's hopefully going to be used to redevelop the tools into a digital form, because given the circumstances, obviously we can't do face-to-face. So we'll be able to provide remote sessions for young people to be able to access um, the same sort of content. Thank you. Well, stay with us while we chat to our panel. Stephanie, listening to Harry there, do older teenagers start automatically thinking about managing their finances or do you need to nudge them into it? Um, I think they certainly do. Um, Learning about money is often something we find when we go into schools and colleges um, that the young people have actually asked for. You know, uh, they've asked their teachers, can we learn more about this, please? Um, And they've they've got the money charity in. Um, I think um, the bit that they need a bit more help with is sort of where to start and what they need to know because it can seem quite daunting um, and they don't really know where to start. And that's sometimes the same for teachers. You know, teachers don't necessarily know how to talk to young people about money, which is why organisations like ourselves exist to help. Um, And often, um, as Harry mentioned there, um, particularly the older ones who are starting to think about the next steps, you know, going off to university, doing an apprenticeship, joining the world of work, um, they're really thinking about it and thinking about becoming more financially independent. And there's certainly a sense of, you know, not wanting to to mess things up. They hear in in the media about people who get into problem debt and that sort of thing. And and they really want to, to, you know, do the right thing, manage their money well, um, and, and want help to be able to do that. How much can be taught in the classroom? Well, uh, we deliver topics on sort of almost everything you can think of um, in terms of managing money. So we have 22 different modules um, covering all sorts of things like budgeting, saving, borrowing, student finance, mortgages, insurance. Um, And um, we make them, you know, interactive um, and try to bring those sorts of real life decisions that they'll be making in the future to the classroom um, through different activities and challenges. So um, things like, you know, giving a group of students some fake money saying, here's your budget. Here's a a list of things you you will 
need to spend money on and how much they might cost. You decide how much you're going to spend on each thing um, and, um, you know, fight it out between you, decide what mm. your priorities are and make decisions. Um, we even do like a retirement quiz um, in our <laughs> pensions workshop, getting young people to think really far ahead. Um, so there's lots of things you can do in the classroom um, that, that can really um, help them start to think about the real decisions they will be making. Rebecca, there's a huge breadth of topics outlined there that, that clearly are all really important. But what are the money topics children want to learn while they're still in school? We get asked all sorts of questions and they're not always directly related to the material that, you know, we're going to cover in our workshops. But something that we find really useful is to have, you know, expert led trainers who can answer these difficult questions. Things like minimum wage, often young people are very amazed at the amount and there's often a debate around whether it should be, you know, even for every single age or why there's a difference. Um, how banks work and interest, you know, some things that your your children were were talking about at the very beginning. Um, tax is a big one, something that a lot of adults are often quite surprised by. You know, do children and young people really want to learn about tax? <laughs> Actually, we find that they're fascinated by it because it's something they see on the news, they hear about, they know that it's something to do with work, but they don't fully understand how the process works. So they're really, really interested to start asking questions about that and develop their own understanding. And on top of that, it's things like, how do I get rich? You know, how do I <laughs> how do I get rich as quick as I can? And really, those conversations are about maximizing your income and understanding that the best way to be financially secure is about balancing your, you know, your needs and your wants and managing the money you have well. Elizabeth, what's going on psychologically at that age for teenagers? Do, do parents or peers or, or the adverts that they're bombarded with, what what wins out? Well, I think this is really interesting because we kind of assume that teenagers aren't interested in these kind of things. But actually, there is so much more independence amongst young people now. Most of them have digital devices. They're really digitally native. They're very savvy about that kind of stuff. And the young people that I work with are interested in a lot of um, secondhand um, online markets and, and buying things, reselling them. They're actually kind of got that entre entrepreneurial spirit. And this is something that we can really tap into. So I would agree they are really hungry for this knowledge. They want to know how bank accounts work, how different cards work, how different products work, um, profit margins. This is the kind of stuff that really captures them because they have that kind of unquenchable enthusiasm for life. I mean, it's a little bit hard to see when they're kind of grunting on the sofa. You can't get much <laughs> out of them. But rest assured, when they go into the world, they're kind of, you know, that all of that enthusiasm that they bring to the things that they are passionate about Absolutely. I mean, the young people that I work with who have a secondhand market in trainers, I mean, this has kind of blown my mind a bit, but all this kind of stuff really captures their interest. And I think this is a platform that we can engage them with to talk about money. Harry, you're clearly really, really engaged in, in personal finances. You did this course as a teenager and you're, you're, you're delivering it now. I wasn't great with money when I was 20. So do you put what you've learned into practice or do you sometimes slip up? Um, well, I try my best to as, as much as I can. But um, a lot of the time, like, what I've learned really from the program and stuff is it's really good to make decisions from like an early age and that sort of thing. So for me, one of the big things I took from even just my training of the program is how I can like build up my credit score from a young age. So when it comes to the point in life where I'm going to look at stuff like mortgages and stuff, I'm in a better position at that point. And I know already um, like some of the youth workers were speaking to me at my training and said like, for them, doing stuff like that um, actually surprises lenders and that sort of thing. We are giving them mortgages and they're like, for your age, that's really good. So it's little things like that that can make a big difference for adulthood, really. Harry, thank you very much for joining us and telling us about the scheme you're involved in. We've had a few tweets on the importance of earning money. Mike says, our daughters have had jobs since age 13. It really helped them understand how hard it is to have the money for a concert ticket or a laptop. And Ben says, earning my own money from age 13 with a morning paper round and then Saturday jobs when I turned 15 helped me recognise the value of money more than anything. Elizabeth, really quickly, we're in this crisis, in a pandemic. It might not be as easy for teenagers to get jobs. So if parents are paying pocket money... Is it better to pay kids to do chores? Is that is that a, a step up from just handing them cash? For lots of families, that really makes sense. And I would really encourage it because it is about learning that money is earned. And that's a really vital lesson. Thank you. Well, let's talk next to the money blogger, uh, Kara Gamel now. Kara, good afternoon. Hi there. Hello. You have a seven-year-old daughter. How are you teaching her about money? Well, in our house, um, I've been using a jam jar system to teach my daughter about money. So anytime that she gets 
any cash, whether it's from chores or a birthday money or even the tooth fairy, she takes it and divides it among three glass jars, which we've labelled one for saving, one for sharing and one for spending. So literal jam jars. So she, she divides what her pocket money up each week. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're just jars I had laying around the house. And I wanted her to be able to decide, depending on how much money she had, how she wanted to spend it, but also to think about the different ways to spend it. So saving for the long term, you know, for a seven-year-old is buying something that's 20 pounds, not her pension. But also (laughs) when you have a little bit extra money, you know, looking after other, helping out other people if you can. And is that working? It is. It really is. And we've been doing it for a couple of years. And, you know, it's not a huge act, but it's really started. I can see that the process of her, you know, being able to be in charge of spending some of her own money, um, saving it and sharing it, it's really created an experience where she can have positive um, emotions. To, with money. And I think it's the satisfaction that's connected with that has been really well. And, you know, because they're glass jars, your child can watch the money build up, but they can also see it disappear. Really interesting. Thanks for telling us about that. Rebecca, there are so many pocket money apps and, and saving schemes. Care is just using jars. Do you think it helps to have that visual aid when you're trying to teach children to save? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we try to use tactile subjects, uh, objects in our in our face to face sessions and also encourage it through our our home learning material. And it can be as simple as having a jar and being able to physically put a coin into a jar. Society is becoming more cashless. A lot of studies are now showing that people are likely to spend more money when they don't have to hand something physical over. They're tapping a card on a on a reader instead and using contactless. A child actually being able to see their money grow within a jar or a pot is, you know, a really, really beneficial thing. Elizabeth, what if parents do what Care is doing and their children just want to spend the money? They don't want to save it. They don't want to donate it. Should you nudge them to to the positive behaviours or should you just let them work it out? Well, I I feel really strongly that one of the things we have to learn is spending, because if we don't spend money, that's just called hoarding. It's not actually called saving, because the purpose of saving is to build up to have something more than you would have had if you had spent the smaller increments. Ah. So actually, there's a really important lesson in that experience of parting with your money to get the item and then having that whole discussion with yourself about was was this item that I've got worth the amount of money that I parted for? Am I as happy with this item as I would have been had I have saved the money. And that is a lesson that you need to live. You need to feel that. And children need to go through it a few times to decide, actually, would I have preferred to save this money? And the su- the younger they do that, the, the smaller the impact. There's, a f- there's fewer mistakes they can make when they're younger. So for me, I'd like children to make mistakes while they're safe enough to do so, while we're still helping them and backing them up so that they don't make mistakes when they're bigger. It's clearly not just setting up these systems. It's having a series of ongoing conversations, isn't it? Yeah, it, it really is. It, it's what, what we know about the experience of, of money in this country is it's something very difficult to talk about. We still, as a nation, find it hard to speak about money. So what happens is children are learning or being exposed to the values in their family without any of the discussion or the understanding that goes around it. We're transmitting those values without really giving the lessons that go with it. And I say to parents all the time, you would teach your child to cross the road, teach them to get dressed and to brush their teeth. Explicitly, you would teach them those things. I'm arguing, why are you not teaching them about money? Because the consequences of not learning that are much more significant. So let's take the emotion out of it. Let's be pragmatic. Let's be scientists. Let's teach them these valuable life skills. Stephanie, one of those jars carers set up, they're for donations. You work for a charity. Is it important to talk to young people about giving or should we just at this age hammer home those saving and budgeting lessons? Uh, Absolutely. I think it is important to talk about giving. Um, It's really important to talk to them about all the things that they might want to spend their money on now and in the future um, and what might be their priorities um, and especially things that they might not have thought about, like giving to charity. Um, If you have a clear idea about what your spending priorities are um, and what's less important, then you're going to be much better at building an effective budget. Um, And it's really important to include everything for a budget to work. and also one of the you know one of the exciting things about becoming an adult is having choice around what you do with your money um, and deciding how you'd like to use money to help other people could be a really important part of that
Mike's emailed to say, at school in the 60s and 70s, we got taught things such as modulated fractions and long division, both of which I have never had to do in my life. I'm now 60. No one taught me about bank accounts or interest or checkbooks, which would have been more useful to say the least. And ZA says, don't start talking to your children about not being able to afford anything. You'll get them to think about money negatively and could lead them to being bitter about not being able to afford something. Talk about need over want, our desires, but never talk about not having enough enough. Elizabeth, do you, do you think that that's something parents factor in? Well, I think that whole debate about want and need is really important because as a child, that's quite a difficult thing to get a handle on. And I think your wants really drive the forefront of your thinking when you're quite small. So that's a really helpful distinction. And it is really important if you're going to talk about money to balance that conversation with all the wonderful things that we have in life that don't cost money. This is not about upsetting children or making them think that the world is a big and scary place. Actually, the world is an amazing place. And if you see it through a child's eyes, you can really connect to that. The reality is that money is part of this dialogue, but only a small part of it. We're getting lots of emails on, on, on a whole variety of these topics. Uh, Kahal has emailed to say, I am rubbish with money, but my eldest son is excellent with it. I give him an allowance and he buys his own stuff. It's a little annoying at times, but I really respect him for it. And if you want proof that Moneybox listeners are incredibly financially switched on, here's an email from Barbara. She says, my brother decided to give his children their pocket money annually to teach them about budgeting and saving. When my nephew asked for an early birthday present, my brother suggested he bought it himself, promising to refund the money on my, his birthday. My nephew, aged 13, immediately complained that he would lose three months of interest. I then agreed to pay my 13-year-old daughter in six months instalments. Unbeknownst to me, she had already researched accounts and decided which bank she wants to use. And Steve says, weekly pocket money helped me. It wasn't a lot, half a crown in the late 60s, but it taught me to spend wisely or save. We've had one email from Jennifer who says, please be aware children under 16 must have a licence from the local authority to work. Rebecca, is that the case? Uh, yeah, so for any child between 13 and 16 years old, uh, if they're going to empl be employed, they need to have a work permit from the local council. David's been in touch and joins us now. David, hello. You had an unusual way of teaching your 11-year-old about budgeting, didn't you? Yes, uh, purely from a selfish perspective, comes to the annual family holiday we're a family of five and it's a bit of a chore it's a bit of a Christmas holiday for myself to try and then organise all of this anybody knows what it's like to try and organise uh, your, your family holiday online mm. and my son was always sort of looking over my shoulder trying to sort of help me out and de-stress me so I said well here you go Bob just help us out you know over to you and uh, as with many of his generation he was 11 at the time He's a ninja. He's an absolute star with trying to work out the different uh, price ratings, the different uh, options that might be available. We gave him a brief. We gave him a budget. And, and he was away. It was, it was fabulous. We've had some fabulous holidays as a result of his hard work. And how did you motivate him to take the time to do that? Uh, he didn't really. He's, he's, he's such a. I have to say, because I'm his dad, but he's like he's a, such a lovely lad. He didn't really need much motivation, but I, I sort of transposed my thinking on it. Thought I need a bit of an incentive, so I said whatever he was able to save on the budget we gave him, he could have between his two sisters and himself, and have a spending money on holiday. So where did you end up when Bob was booking? Uh, the first one was a um, beautiful place called Carvalho, which is in on the Algarve. And that was just, it's still, the, the, we all talk about it as being one of our best family holidays. And he's followed that up with uh, holidays to Spain. Uh, we went to the States. We had a two-center holiday in um, Los Angeles and San Francisco. He's, he just delivers each time. David, it sounds like the budget went up, though, over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I mean that wasn't him driving it up. That was that was that was us just as the kids get older, been wanting to do more sort of exotic things and want to have more of an interesting holiday. And uh, we we were able to we were in a position to be able to do that. But nevertheless, you know, it still uh, had to be done on a on a on a reasonable budget. And things like car hire and the flights and all the insurances and bits and pieces that go with it. Um, Bob was just very very good. Uh, he, he worked to the budget and and did the job for us. And do you think that's made him a savvier with his own cash? Yes. Yes. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to say that he's careful, but he's always the first one to get to the Christmas presents and Christmas buying. <laughs> and he's done everything online before anybody else has even started to think about it. And he works on a budget himself. So, And, and everybody's always delighted with what he does. He's, he's, he's just a bit of a star. 
David, it's great to have confidence in your kids, but were you not worried he might mess up your big annual holiday? Yeah, no, that's a very good point because obviously I think there is a danger that you could have this wonderful idea, I think it's very clever, and then suddenly panic and think, where are we going to end up? We can end up in sort of out, out of Mongolia with you know, living in a tent, look, looking at yaks. Um, no, I, I, uh, I, I think it's quite important to be able to give them the space to be able to work it out for themselves because that's all part of learning. And I think you just have to trust. Obviously, we were watching. Um, he was only 11 when he did his, had his first uh, attempt at it. And we were just so impressed. And he'd come back and he'd, and before he actually booked anything, he'd obviously say, look, this is what I found. This is what it's about. And obviously, credit cards need to be used. And obviously, that's down to none of that. But he, he effectively did all the legwork for us. And I think grew in confidence from doing that. It's such a fantastic story. Thank you so much for telling us about it. Well done, Bob. Listening to that is our panel. Panel, what do you think of this pretty, pretty unorthodox way of teaching budgeting? What a great idea. Um, I think it just shows, you know, when you give young people res- responsibility, generally they relish it and they and they rise to the challenge. Um, and, you know, what a great way to learn about budgeting for a holiday, knowing that dad's there to help if needed, um, rather than having to do it all on your own for the first time when you're an adult. Um, you've got that ni- nice, safe environment. Um, I'm not sure I'd be brave enough to do that with my <laughs> daughter, um, but she's only one, so I've got some time to... to to build up that trust. <laughs> Elizabeth, is it is it important to let children make mistakes sometimes? I think it's hugely important to, to make mistakes in lots of areas of life because, first of all, it's how we learn. And we need to teach children that we're not trying to get through life without ever getting anything wrong. That's a bit unrealistic. But particularly with money, it's really important to allow them, whilst they've still got the safety of adults around them and to support them and to talk them through that these decisions and when things go wrong, it's really important because money is one of those things that you actually need to physically do, to use, to experience. It's, it's a really sort of lived experience thing it it, it doesn't work very well if you keep it in the hypothetical so actually let them have a go let them make some choices let them buy the magazine with the very plasticky toy stuck on the front and get it home and decide that they don't like it and they've already got three of those and actually it wasn't a good use of their pocket money because there's a really important lesson in that one that they then won't repeat next time or hopefully won't repeat as they get older Rebecca would you let an 11 year old book your break (laughs) <laughs> I don't know if I'd necessarily trust an 11 year old with my holiday but I mean I'd be willing to potentially give it a go but there's you know there's lots of other things that that children can get involved in in the home if parents aren't quite brave enough to um to go down the holiday route I guess you know we we're very fortunate we we've, we've been supported by kickstart money to create a fantastic home resources that go along the exact same route maybe not to the extreme sort of spending level of a holiday but things like a weekly food shop you know we we focus on your day-to-day spends um anything you're going to go out and buy new school uniform is a, a prime example um we have activities around budgeting for baking a cake um you know because actually there's ingredients that need to be bought for this kind of thing and it's these these day-to-day activities where adults have to think about the costs Uh, Lots of these are a way of opening up the conversation. That's all we have time for in this episode of Moneybox Live. Huge thanks to all our callers and to our panel. Rebecca Kelly from My Bank, Dr Elizabeth Kilby and Stephanie Fitzgerald from The Money Charity. Thank you all. And thanks for all your messages and emails. Remember, you can email us at any time with a money issue you want us to look into. It's moneybox at bbc.co.uk or you can tweet us at Moneybox. We read every message that we get. We frequently get people onto the show. Next week on Moneybox Live, we'll be looking at cryptocurrencies as Bitcoin reaches another record high. Is it a safe investment or is it a bubble? And what exactly is it anyway? Email us with your questions or your experiences now. I hope you enjoyed that download of Moneybox Live. The programme is broadcast every week at 3pm on Wednesdays. There's more information and details of how to contact us on our BBC Moneybox website. We tweet at at Moneybox. And if you want us to look into something, email moneybox at bbc.co.uk. Hello, this is Jane Garvey. I'm with my broadcasting friend, Fee Glover. Come in, Fee. Oh, thank you, darling. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, all right. Uh, we do a podcast together called Fortunately. It has been surprisingly successful. And you'd be, honestly, you'd be really 
quite, quite choked with emotion to discover that other people have found us. Some of them have quite enjoyed it. Other people like carping. We welcome all comers. We don't care who you are, where you are, what you do or what you think, as long as you're prepared to join with us in, well, what do we do, Fee? We kind of unravel, we unburden, we unload. What do we do? We're a self-help group of two that other people quite like to witness and we don't really mind if you laugh with us or at us. You're just welcome aboard a slightly rickety midlife ship which occasionally has guests who are far more successful than us but we try not to let that get in the way. We'd love you to join in and, as Fee says, be a part of it. All you have to do if you want to subscribe is pop along to BBC Sounds and search for Fortunately. It could not be more simple than that.